All right, everybody. Good afternoon. And today we're going to learn about a career as um, accountant. And we have Sarah Shaw to um, um, let us um, guide us or um, give us knowledge on how bec to become an accountant. Um, but before that, as you know, don't forget to check in. That's how your teachers know that you're attending this event and you're not anywhere else. And if you have questions, this is a great question documents that you can refer to. And the most important thing is that evaluation. This is how you get um, your grade and the attendance by um, participating in this event. Be fully present, pay attention, ask questions in the chat or raise your hand on the like uh, the Zoom has the raise hand thing and um, also, you can turn on your videos, your camera, you're not going to get, you're not going to show in the recording. And most importantly, submit your evaluation. This is how you, we track and give you credit. And that's, you're going to need that to graduate in Oregon. And that is it. Let's have Sarah share. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm getting a little bit of a strange glare, so I do apologize about this. I'm going to go ahead. I, I prepared a presentation for you so you don't have to just stare at my face the whole time and watch me talk. So hopefully this will be a little bit more dynamic for you. I'm um, going to do this. Okay. All right. Can everybody see uh, the first slide? Perfect. All right. Okay. So I am I'm thrilled to be able to be here presenting with you today. Um, I am uh, I'm a CPA. I'm a certified public accountant. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, here's my agenda that I've prepared. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of my background. I'm gonna tell you, uh, you know, what a CPA is. Um, I'm going to help tell you how I help clients and how I interact with clients. And then what I like best about my profession, kind of future trends, and then we'll open, open it up to some questions. So, um, I was born and raised in Fairbanks, Alaska. So uh, I have a little bit of a unique, a unique background. Here's me as a little girl. I had a three-legged dog, <laughs> Carmen, and I grew up not being afraid of the cold, not being afraid of the snow, as you can see in the picture there. Um, uh, and this river here, actually, I love this picture. Um, to the left here that shows the snow encrusted trees in the river. Usually the river is frozen over solid uh, in the winter time. And it's frozen over so solid in the winter that you actually can drive across it. And so this area right here in this picture actually would freeze over and we referred to it as the ice bridge. And uh, people would always drive their cars from side to side um, and take a shortcut um, because we didn't have a formal bridge and um, a car would always go through the ice every spring when the snow was melting and it was always just kind of everybody was always taking bets on okay when is the car going to go through the ice or can I drive over the ice bridge one last time so that's where I'm from Fairbanks is about um, is about the size of Hillsboro Oregon um, so it's 100,000 population, which I believe that's Hillsborough's population. So it's about that size. I um, was a Wood River wolf pup in elementary school. And you can see a theme here for Alaska. And then in high school, I was part of the West Valley Wolf Pack. And there were two big high schools in the area. There was Lathrop, which was, you know, the nemesis. And then there was West Valley. And I was, I was the West Valley Wolf Pack. Um, so I <laughs> threw this slide in here just so you could see. I grew up with a very close family. Um, my father was hysterical. He kept the family laughing constantly. As you can see in this picture, which I'm sorry, the quality is not very good. This actually was taken at church, if that shows you how ill-behaved he was. He is a professor of physics, and so I grew up in a university. Um, Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska has a has a really important um, university. It's primarily a research university. They do a lot of Arctic research up there, and they study the aurora borealis. 
And, um, and secondary, it's a college. They, they do, you know, college degrees, they do advanced degrees. Um, and my father was a professor of physics. So um, he was always uh, misbehaving and acting out. I actually ended up going, um, I, you know, I, I played violin in high school and I was very involved in an in orchestra and playing the violin. And um, I devoted a lot of time to that. And when it came time to go to college, I really didn't want to do music as a, you know my college degree, which surprised everybody. And so I actually ended up going to Brigham Young, Brigham Young University, BYU. It's a big school down in uh, kind of the Salt Lake City, Utah area. And I really struggled um, when I was at BYU. I, I, I declared right out of the gate, I declared a biochemistry major because I you know, kind of wanted to follow in the footsteps of my father, a scientist. And, um, and, and, I, and I really struggled with that. And so I ended up leaving Brigham Young University and I ended up going back home to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And this is just part of the campus. Um, part of the campus here. You can see this actually was the Geophysical Institute where my father worked in the International Arctic Research Center where he ended up also working. And there's actually, a, this is the research part of the university and down, this is actually sitting up on a hill and down below is the actual college and the dorms. Um, and I loved, and, and I ended up declaring a general business major when I was at UAF. Uh, because I, I didn't know what to do. Science clearly wasn't my thing. I didn't want to do music, um, you know, and so I was like, oh, I'll just do general business. And when I was enrolled in general business, um, I, you know, you have to take an accounting class. You have to take accounting 101. And accounting is a very polarizing topic. You either love it or you hate it. Um, I loved it. I felt like I found my calling in life. Um, and really enjoyed the class. And so I remember marching to the um, registrar's office, the enrollment office and changing my major immediately to accounting. And I'm really glad I did because it's, um, it's, been, it's been a great career as you'll see as we progress during this presentation. So some fun things about Alaska. So this is a really idealized, beautiful picture um, but this is really what it looked like most of the year. <laughs> and there was this sign. So this is a Celsius sign, you know, and I mean, you know, we usually tell temperature in Fahrenheit here. Um, the equivalent of this minus 45 degrees Celsius is actually minus 49 degrees Fahrenheit. And this was one of the most popular things to do at UAF is when the temperature plummeted like this to put on your swimsuit and go down and take a picture next to the temperature sign. And if you Google UAF, you know, you can find just tons and tons of these photos. This is not me. This is just a random picture I found online. <laughs> so, uh, so, and you know, I graduated from UAF with a degree in accounting and I wanted to become a CPA. Um, the, the accounting degrees, in college, they really push becoming a CPA. CPA means certified public accountant. Um, in Canada, it's a chartered accountant. Uh, we had a lot of Canadian students in, um, enrolled at UAF. And um, basically what it means is each state has a CPA designation and they have varying requirements, although there's been a lot of convergence amongst, amongst the 50 states over what they require to be a CPA. So basically, it's an accounting professional who's met state licensing requirements. And there's four prongs to those licensing requirements. It's education. So typically a college degree is required. And most states, I, I don't, I could be, I, remember I wasn't originally licensed in Oregon. I was actually originally licensed in Alaska. And then I got my license here in Oregon through reciprocity between those states. So I know Alaska's <laughs> rules. I don't think Oregon requires 150 credit hours. I could be wrong. Um, but in Alaska, I was required to have 150 credit hours, which is actually a little bit beyond a uh, college degree in accounting. I think that's approximately 130-ish credits, college credits. And so a lot of students will go on and do a master's degree 
in order to get their, their credit hours to take the CPA exam. You don't have to do, you don't have to do a master's degree. Um, but you know, you could take, and it doesn't matter what those 150 credit hours are in. Like you have to have an accounting emphasis and you have to have, you know, some core accounting classes, but you know, the extra 20 credits could be in ballroom dance for all, for all they care. <laughs> Um, or yoga or whatever class that you, you know, like taking. There's also an experience requirement that you, you know, you have to work under the supervision of another CPA for at least a year. In Alaska, that was two years. I had to work for two years per CPA. Now, that can either be in public accounting at a public accounting firm, or it can be, um, it can be, you know, you can go to work for Intel or for Nike or for Columbia Sportswear and work under the supervision of a CPA. Um, so it doesn't have to be at a public accounting firm, um, but you, it, 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 they have the very specific requirements about that experience requirement. The third thing is the exam. There's a professional exam. You've all heard of probably the bar exam, which is what attorneys take. Uh, attorneys take the professional bar exam and uh, uh, CPAs take the CPA exam. It's a four part professional exam. You don't have to take all four parts in one sitting. Um, you can, you know, schedule them, you know, over. I think once you pass one section of the exam, then the clock starts ticking. Then you have a year and a half to pass the other four parts. Um, it, they used to require you to take it all in one sitting. And so that's, it's, it's a, a nice, it's nice to break it up because it's a, a lot of content. And then the fourth thing is ethics. There is, um, so CPAs are governed by um, an American, the American Institute of CPAs, the AICPA. And so you can see here, you know, I have the American Institute of CPAs. There is an ethics exam. Um, I mean, honestly, if you are an ethical person, this ethical, this ethics exam is not, a, it's not a hard exam to pass, but it's, it's important and they want to, um, and ethics is a big part of, of what we do as being a certified public accountant. So the CPA exam is probably the biggest hurdle. Um, I, there's four parts, auditing and attestation, business environment concepts, financial accounting and reporting and regulation, which is taxes. So it's tax law. And most of most employers will pay uh, for your study materials, which can be very expensive. And I do recommend if you want to become a CPA and you want it to pass the CPA exam um, to buy a professional exam study aid, they're usually about $1,000, $1,500. So they're very expensive. Like I said, most employers will pay for that for you or they'll give you a budget towards it. Um, and you can pick what you like best. Um, and then they'll also pay the exam fee for you to take each, each section. Um, so it, there are there are some um, there's a lot of assistance there, um, which is great because not everybody has, you know, that dis sort of disposable income to put towards education. Um, I wanted to show. Um, I don't know if you can. I'm going to actually stop sharing here for just a minute so you can see my face. I'm going to stop the share. I actually have my, these are my flashcards that I still have to this day. And um, I hand wrote all of these flashcards and it's for all four sections. And I would carry, I would take a chunk of them and I'd put them in my purse. And when I was at the DMV, when I was at the Department of Motor Vehicles waiting to renew my driver's license, or if I was waiting to get an oil change, or I was waiting in line at the bank, or wh wherever I was, I would actually get these out of my purse and I'd start flipping through, through these flashcards. And I've never been able to throw them away because I put so much effort into writing these. And um, you can see they're old. The rubber bands have all broken off. <laughs> and, um, you know, not everybody does not everybody puts that sort of effort um, into the CPA exam, exam, but it's important to know what sort of a learner you are. Um, and for me, I, um, I retain things in my mind when I write them down. When I, not when I type them, but when I actually get out a good old fashioned pen here and write them down on a piece of paper. 
And so for me, the process of writing down, writing down these questions and then writing the answer on the backside and then quizzing myself, that really helped. Like I said, not everybody, um, not everybody is uh, that sort of a learner. Okay. All right, hold on, let me share here again. Okay, all right, so CPA exam, big hurdle. Kind of fun too, um, it, honestly, kind of a fun exam. And once you pass it, you never have to pass it again. So I've been licensed in four different states, Alaska, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and now Oregon. And you, I've only had to take the exam once because there's reciprocity between states. Okay, back to ethics, <laughs> ethics, ethics, ethics. So the Oregon Board of Accountancy um, or any state board of accountancy, it's a government agency, um, it licenses CPAs. And if we click through here, um, and I will in just a moment, um, one of the biggest purposes of this board of accountancy is so to ensure that the CPAs who are in the profession of public accounting are complying with ethics. And we have to comply with the American Institute of CPAs, the AICPA's Code of Professional Conduct. And that's a massive part. It guides everything that we do. Um, we have to honor the public interest. So the, the public is, they're, they're, they're trusting us to be honest, right? Um, and so we can't put our clients, we can't lie on behalf of our clients. We have to, or even if, you know, a client is just doing something improperly and they don't know it, we need to adjust so that we keep the public's interest. We have to have we have to behave with integrity. We have to um, we have to behave with objectivity, so we can't have conflicts of interest with our clients. Um, one of the biggest things is we have to be independent, and you're going to see in the slides later on why this word is so important in my profession. Independence is huge. I have to be independent in fact and in thought. So it is, and in appearance as well. So even though I'm independent, I can't do anything that would, um, you know, be construed as, um, as interfering with independence. So here's an example for you. I have a very large client. They're an excavation client. Um, and I help them with a lot of different, you know, aspects of their business. And um, they wanted me to have an office there at their, at their, uh, you know, place of business. And I can't, even though that would not have impaired my independence, I can't have an office there because it, in appearance, it would make it look like I'm not independent. Uh, so, and, and, you know, it, you know, having an office at a client's would um, would very quickly turn into not being independent, <laughs> quite frankly. So I have to exercise due professional care and um, I have to avoid acts discreditable, discreditable, which is a weird way of saying it, but that's how it's referred to in, um, in the AICPA code of professional, professional conduct. And that's basically, I can't, I can't, I can't do fraudulent things. I can't lie to clients. Um, I can't hold myself out as a CPA to the public and not actually be a licensed CPA. Um, I can't um, discriminate in my employment practices. I can't, um, you know, um, harass people in my employment practices. It also governs in what cases I'm allowed to work for a commission. Um, um, if I decided to, you know, tell a client, I'm going to get you a certain result and you're going to pay me a commission based on that result, um, uh, that's actually considered an act discreditable, um, in, in certain cases. And there's all sorts of things. Um, and this is what the Oregon Board of Accountancy does. They make sure that we're meeting all of these things. So I'm going to take you right here to the Oregon, Oregon.gov Board of Accountancy. And you can see there are lots of um, lots of resources here. They have it licensees, so people who want to become CPAs. Um, you can see I was clicking through some of these. 
um, as a licensee, a CPA, I have to do continuing professional education each year, take classes and stay current. Um, and I wanted to show you this and here's for exams and candidates. Here's firm registration. We, we with certain, with certain um, services that I provide to the public, I have to be peer reviewed. My peers have to review my work. Um, and then of course, um, disciplinary action report. If somebody is mad at their CPA and they wanna see, hey, were they disciplined? So you can actually go here, licensee lookup, and you can basically licensee lookup tool, and you can come here and you can search, and I'm gonna type here, I'm gonna be a little loud. So you can see right here, I am an individual, and here's my full name, um, here's my license number that's, uh, you know, per, that Oregon has given me. And here's when I hear I'm active. I'm an active CPA. Disciplinary? No, I have not been disciplined. So that's great. <laughs> also, I have my own firm. And so I have my firm registered here. And so you can look up anybody who is a CPA here on the license lookup tool. So I'm just going to X out of that. Okay, so why is the CPA profession so important? I don't know. Um, uh, Enron, Enron probably predates a lot of you. <laughs> but when I was in high school, um, and I graduated in the year 2000, that was the year I graduated from high school, um, Enron was a major scandal in the years that ensued. And I remember watching the news. And I remember, I remember so many tragic things about the Enron. I mean, Enron, the Enron scandal really rocked America. So I'm gonna walk you through this. It's one of the most notorious um, uh, corporate scandals. And it also completely changed the field of public accounting. So 1995, I was a, let's see. I think I was probably still in junior high that year, yeah. I was, I was, I was in junior high, so I wasn't yet a freshman in high school. Um, Enron was named America's most innovative company. And it was named by Fortune magazine and it was six years consecutively. Like they were a big deal. Everybody loved Enron. So in 1998, this very infamous person now, Andy Fistow, or Fisto, I'm not quite certain how to pronounce his name. He was named CFO, that's chief financial officer. That's a big deal. And he basically creates this insanely complex web of fraudulent companies. He creates all these new companies and there were hundreds, if not thousands of them. And the ownership and the levels of who owned who was so complex, nobody could follow it. And he did it to hide Enron's losses because Enron actually, even though they you know, had this amazing share price and they were, everybody loved them, they actually had these massive losses and they were hiding them. So then 2000, the year that I graduate high school, Enron's share price skyrockets to an all-time high of $90.56. That's kind of almost not really laughable now, but I mean, you know, like I think for Facebook's or what are they called? I don't, I can't remember what they're called now. <laughs> but I think Facebook shares are like over $200 per share right now. Um, so, you know, but this was really high for 2000. Then fast forward, you know, a little bit and Enron all of a sudden is reporting this $1.2 billion value write off. And, um, you know, we hear a lot of billions quotes in the news nowadays with public companies, but this was a lot of money in 2000, 2001. Investors panic and the stock price plunges. So next slide. Now things happen really rapidly. So October 2001, Arthur Anderson, the CPA, this is a big accounting firm, their CPA begins shredding unrun audit files. So why is my title now the big five is the big four? So Arthur Anderson was what we called the big five. It was the big five accounting firms. And uh, let's see, um, they actually, they collapsed because of Enron as we'll walk through here. 
And now we have the big four. So if you hear people refer to the big four, um, and you don't have to say the big four accounting firms, just the big four, that means the big four accounting firms. It's KPMG, it's Deloitte, it's Ernst & Young, and it's PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC. Those are the big four. And before Enron, it was the big five, and Arthur Anderson was in there too. And those are the firms. These are the big, big, big public accounting firms. These are the people, the big, the big, oops, sorry. Woo. There we go. The big four were the ones, are the ones nowadays who audit Intel. They audit Nike. They audit any, they audit Facebook. Um, and they are preparing the taxes. They, these are big companies and they do major work for clients. So back to the timeline here. So 2001, Arthur Anderson, the big five, starts shredding files on the advice of their legal counsel. Again, October 2001, the SEC launches a probe into Enron and Enron admits to inflating their income, hiding their losses. Then fast forward just a couple of months, Enron declares chapter 11 bankruptcy and the stock falls to 26 cents per share. Now remember, $90.56, which was huge back then, now to 26. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm surprised it was even 26 cents. There's some net value, sorry, net residual value to the assets they owned, clearly. That to this day, that was the largest bankruptcy in history. Um, it, you know, there are some really famous bankruptcies throughout American history. One of them was WorldCom which was just a year later after Enron. It was a massive bankruptcy. And, um, and also there, uh, I don't know if you remember um, the, the 2008 financial or, or market financial collapse, um, but Lehman Brothers was a, was a big one that declared bankruptcy. I remember that. I remember walking into my boss's office the morning of Lehman Brothers in 2008 and asking him if America was gonna survive. <laughs> Because <laughs> it was it was really frightening to see these you know big companies collapse. So Enron was a massive bankruptcy. January two thousand two, the Justice Department launches a criminal investigation, and then in June two thousand two, Enron CPA Arthur Anderson is convicted of obstructing justice. Um, now they were later apparently exonerated, um, but the damage had been done to their reputation, and Arthur Anderson no longer exists in its same form. So um, they, why is this important? This is important because this rocked the accounting world because they were allowed, this corporation was allowed to pull off this massive scandal and dupe shareholders and employees. I remember, I remember watching the news and he, they were interviewing employees of Enron, just regular everyday people like you and me. And they were talking about how they had saved all their money in their retirement accounts. And they had done all these things and they had put money and invested money in the company because they believed in it. And then they lost everything. And how tragic that was that these people lost everything. It was, it was, it was a horrible thing. And their accountant, their CPA um, enabled them. And by the way, Arthur Anderson, they had offices at Enron. <laughs> so they literally, they didn't even have offices at Arthur Anderson anymore. Their, their team of CPAs, they had hundreds. They actually had desks and offices at Enron. So, all right. So the field of accounting was completely changed by Enron. And we get this Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. We refer to it as SOX. And basically, this is a bipartisan response to the corporate scandal. Sarbanes and Oxley were two senators, one of them, and I, I don't have my notes here, but one of them's a Republican, one of them's a Democrat, one is from, I believe, Maryland, and one is from Ohio. And they co-sponsored this act. And, and it basically, it creates this new board that is still around to this day and very active called the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And the PCAOB oversees Nike's reporting, Intel's reporting, Columbia Sportswear, Facebook's, all of them. And they create new rules about independence. 
for all CPAs. Remember that code of professional conduct that I brought up earlier? This was came about or was enhanced because of Enron. And basically it restricts non-audit services that CPAs can provide. So I have to be independent. It requires partner rotation. So these big, big, big firms, when you do the same audit, the same job, let's say I'm auditing, let's say I'm auditing Intel and I keep using Intel because my husband works there. So I am auditing Intel. And if I audit Intel for seven years, I kind of start thinking, oh, I know Intel. Um, I, I stop using as much professional judgment and I stop using as much professional skepticism. Professional skepticism is a huge part of what I do. I have to be professional, but I have to be skeptical of everything that the client says. Um, I trust, but verify. <laughs> so um, they actually require partner rotation at these large firms. So the big four, they have to, um, and, I, and I don't know the number of years. And so I apologize. Um, five to seven years, the partners have to rotate. And it also enhanced financial reporting. And, um, and this actually does affect me on a day-to-day -day basis that when I'm preparing financial statements, which is the, you know, so accounting is considered the language of business. It's taking a business and it's putting on paper into this financial statement format so that you can read it and interpret it. And um, it really enhanced financial reporting and it doesn't allow a company to create other companies to hide debt without disclosure of that or a certain treatment. Um, so those entities that they created are actually called um, VIEs, Variable Interest Entities, and they are a valid sort of entity type. Um, so a lot of, let's say, you know, I work with a lot of construction contractors. And so let's say your construction contract, let's say your dad owns this construction contracting firm. It's a large one. Um, and then for liability purposes, he actually decides he's going the land and the building that the construction company is operating out of, you know, owns the land and the building that it's, you know, business is built on. That's a, that's a really valuable asset. Real estate is very valuable. It's highly appreciable, gains value over time. He wants to take those assets out of the operating company and he wants to move them over to a rental LLC to own them over there. And then the company can, can rent the building and the land from, from the real estate. That is a perfectly legitimate transaction. It's actually an advisable transaction. I tell my clients to do that who have a lot of assets, but there are certain rules because of SOX and Enron that we now have to disclose that transaction. And in many cases, consolidate those two entities together for purposes of that financial statement so that we're not misleading anybody. So now I'm going to tell you, um, I've told you about what a CPA is and kind of the history of the profession. Now I'm going to walk you through um, kind of a little bit of my professional background. I started my career after I graduated from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. I went to work for a public accounting firm, Walsh, Kelleher & Sharp. We clearly had loads of fun. We had a really big uh, St. Patty's Day party every year. There is green beer, which I don't think you can really see it in the but it was a lot of fun. I worked, um, there is me. I worked with a lot of really fun uh, from other very intelligent women at the firm. There were men worked there as well, but they're just not in this photo. <laughs> and I was a staff accountant there. Um, and I really, I think that was one of my favorite firms that I ever worked for. Um, here's my old professional photo. It's a little bit, I, it kind of makes me laugh because I kind of look like I have a forced smile. <laughs> I was a senior accountant at Garvey Gar and Garvey and Garvey in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then I went, uh, I, I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and I worked for Morrison Clark and Company. And this accounting firm right here, I was also a senior accountant there. They were what we call a boutique CPA firm. They only did one industry. They did the construction industry. And that's how I became really good at the construction industry. And I created a specialization in the construction industry. It was because of this firm. They hired me and taught me a lot and they are great people. And I'm still, in, I'm still friends with all of them here. Then I moved um, about seven, seven years ago, I moved to Oregon 
And my husband took a job with Intel and I worked for a firm called Jones and Roth. And, um, and I loved my time at Jones and Roth. And I, I started actually as a senior accountant and then I was promoted to manager one, then I was promoted to manager two, and then I was promoted to manage to senior manager. And just, just very recently, actually just in December, I made a very, very difficult decision to actually to leave Jones and Roth. Uh, the next step for me, um, you know, manager one, manager two, senior manager, the next step after senior manager is partner and shareholder. And, and that's about as far as you can go at a CPA firm to become the partner and the shareholder of a firm, the owner of a firm. And um, I, there are 13 other partners at Jones and Roth, and I made the decision for me that I uh, wanted to go out on my own. And so I left Jones and Roth just December 20th and opened my own accounting practice, my own CPA firm. And um, so it's very new and it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of work, but um, yeah. So now I have my own firm. Um, it's a virtual practice right now. Like I said, I've only been in operation maybe two, almost two months now. <laughs> and um, I have a lot, a lot of my former clients that were with me in, at Jones and Ross. Uh, they followed me to, to my new practice. And, um, and so I, I have my own firm here. Oh, you know what? It looks like we have, sorry, the chat that I wasn't seeing here. Um, I'm so sorry. I didn't see these questions. Um, so uh, Danielle had said, sorry, I'm going to review the chat here. Danielle had said 40 degrees Celsius equals 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's very true. Thank you, Danielle, for pointing that out. That's awesome. Um, I actually tried to find a picture that showed the 40 degrees C because I thought that that's such an important, you know, temperature, 40 degrees C equals 40 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 40. And then um, why is it called certified public accountant? Um, it, it, it's just a designation that, um, and of course it's a consistent designation, CPA, so that it's easily recognizable by the public. Um, it's, um, it's not certified public and it's not just certified accountants. Um, and it's also not certified private accountants because private accounting is actually considered a different, uh, a different branch of accounting than public accounting. In private accounting, you're serving your employer. Intel, Nike, Facebook. Um, um, in public accounting, you're serving the public. Even though you have clients and you're doing work on behalf of a client, you're, you're serving the public. The public's interest is your interest. Also, um, do I have to be good at math? Uh, you know what? Um, I get this question a lot. <laughs> I rely very heavily on the calculator. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you don't have to be good at math. Because um, you really don't have to be because you have fancy software that does things for you. I'll tell you what, my job is more similar to an attorney than anything else. My job is knowing the rules and knowing how to interpret the rules. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, so no, you don't have to be good at math to be an accountant. I just blew your whole thing, huh? <laughs> and then what is a typical day in your work life look like? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So I will absolutely get there. And then the compensation um, is, I will also get there too. It's actually really good compensation. Actually, let's talk about that now. It's really good compensation for having a college degree. Um, it's, if you can get your CPA license, so you can be an accountant, you know, you can be an accountant, but you know, not all accountants are CPAs, but all CPAs are accountants, if that makes sense, you know? So getting your CPA designation will, your earning power will increase significantly. So uh, I have a friend who is a CPA and her husband is also a CPA and he works for Columbia Sportswear. And he oversees a team of accountants. And a lot of his team, at, at, even though he's a CPA, a lot of his team, they are accountants and they don't have their CPA designation. And they complain a lot about compensation. They're like, oh, I want a bigger raise. I want a bigger raise. Everybody wants you know, more money. And um, um, it looks like we have somebody here, should I admit? 
sorry, I'll let the, the coordinators here take care of that. I'll just open up this one. Um, and, and so his response to them is, well, go get your CPA license. If you want a big raise, you go get your CPA license and get that, your CPA designation. So it, it's very good compensation, can be very, very long hours though, um, uh, certain times of the year. Um, and then do most accountants work at a firm or have their own firm? Most accountants in their early career work for another CPA. They work at a firm. That's kind of how you learn. That's how you get your experience and how you learn on the job and, and how you're trained. And then you can either, you know, stay at the firm. And I have friends who have, you know, stayed at firms and had great careers. Partners make a lot of money. Partners make, you know, 300K, 400K plus, you know, depending on the firm, the big, the, the big four accounting firms, they make a lot more than that. But, um, uh, and then do I have any employees in my firm? No, I don't have any employees yet. Um, the first year I will likely not have any employees in my firm, um, but I am almost just two months in business. I'm nearly at capacity of what I'm able to do myself. And so I'm absolutely interested in hiring somebody um, next year. And then um, what can st students do now to get ready for the career? Um, you know, you can really, um, I would say, you know, I think that high school matters. I think learn how to study, learn how to study and to, to teach yourself things. For me, high school, I don't think taught me really well, um, didn't prepare me, at least the high school I went to, didn't prepare me for college really well. In college, you know, you have a professor who gives a lecture, but then, you know, you're expected to have read the chapter in the book and to know, you know, what the content of that lecture, the professor comes in and they, they assume that you've read the chapter and that you have some background already. So they're not there necessarily to walk you through every little thing because they assume you already have a baseline level of knowledge. And then, you know, you have to go home and do the homework. And, and so teach yourself how to study. And um, the, the earlier you can do that, the better. And, um, you know, studying, I used to sit down and read the chapter uh, in my accounting textbook or whatever class it was in college, it usually would take me about two hours to read the chapter and, and work through it. That sounds like a lot of time, but just, you know, get yourself, you know, a plate of dinner, you know, sit yourself in your room or someplace quiet and just sit down and, and read the chapter and take notes. For me, I took notes because it helped me remember. And, um, and then follow along in the lecture and, and, and try to participate as, as much as you can. Okay, all right. So going on. So how do I help clients? How do I help clients individually? So I have an emphasis in taxation. I am not part of the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> I don't even have a secret phone number for the Internal Revenue Service, but I help clients navigate the Internal Revenue code. So I listed four things here that I almost help every single one of my clients do. So what business structure best su suits you? Um, there's an S corporation, there's a C corporation, a partnership or a sole proprietorship. And a lot of you see these LLC, you know, these business types. Oh, you know, in fact, I'm an LLC, Sarah Shaw CPA and business advisor LLC. An LLC is actually an entity that's not recognized by the federal government. It's a state creation. And so that, and it's great. It's a great form to operate your business in because it provides really unparalleled liability protection, but it can be taxed as an S corporation. It can be taxed as a partnership and it can be taxed as a sole proprietorship. And that's what I mean by the federal government doesn't recognize LLCs. This is what the federal government recognizes. And so you really want to get your business when you're just opening your own business, you want to get this, the form, the structure, correct. These are all taxed differently. They all have different requirements and it gets very complex. And it's a lot of fun to advise clients on what best suits them. Um, I help clients navigate the Internal Revenue Code, the IRC. This is, this is the Internal Revenue Code is what the IRS enforces. That's why we have to file taxes each year and, and, and pay taxes. Um, there are several buckets of income. 
We have ordinary income, which is like if you, you know, have a job and you get a W-2, you know, you work for Dairy Queen, you work for the movie theater, you work for like Mod Pizza or something, you get a W, you get a wage from them and that's ordinary income. There's investment income, which is like if you have stocks and bonds or, you know, and you have, you know, stock trades, um, actually cryptocurrency falls into the investment income. I have a lot of clients that trade crypto. Um, it's a very hot thing right now. And I, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. And then there's passive income. Passive income is actually rental income. So if your parents own like a rental property and they rent it out, um, they actually, that rental income uh, is a special category. Rentals actually are not considered a trade or business, oddly enough, by the Internal Revenue Service. They are considered passive income and loss. And there are very special rules there. It's, it's kind of a funny thing. And this is why you hire a CPA so that you can learn to understand these things. And then, you know, how you report income to be taxed. So I uh, work with a lot of construction companies and they, um, sorry, let me just check the time here. Oh, running out of time. So a construction companies, they're building a building, right? The really large building. And it takes them maybe, a year and a half to construct this building. And over time, you know, they're getting money from the person they're building the building from, right? To build it. But then they're also paying for materials, they're paying their laborers, they're paying for um, subcontractors to come and do the plumbing and the electrical. It's a big project. And how you determine, whoops, sorry. How you determine, how you report that income, there are lots of different ways, different timing structures that you can report that income. You can make an election with the IRS and wait until you've collected 95% of that, or basically the equivalent of 95% of that, and then pay taxes all at one time. You can pay taxes based on you know, the percentage of the building that's complete. And, and everything in between. There's an infinite number of ways that you can report your income to be taxed. And it's very important that you get it right. Um, and that's why, again, you have a CPA to help advise you on this. So it's not just the Internal Revenue Code. It's also navigating congressional tax law. So COVID-19, we saw a lot of government relief in 2020. I don't know if you remember reading about PPP loans, Paycheck Protection Program. A lot of businesses got PPP loans so that they could keep their doors open and they could, um, you know, keep keep their employees, not fire all their employees. And um, there are just so many, and I won't bore you, but there are just so many provisions that changed in the tax structure for 2020 and 2021. I'll give you a quick example. Um, restaurants were hit so hard by the pandemic. You know, a lot of them in 2020 had to, they were forced to close and, um, or couldn't be open because of the health concerns. And, um, and usually the Internal Revenue Service says that when you're a business and you have a meal, you go out and you, you know, buy dinner with a client, that's only 50% deductible. Let's say you have a really nice meal and it's $100. The IRS says you only get to deduct 50% of that $100. You only get to deduct $50, $50 of that because you have to eat to live. And, you know, we're, we're already kind of throwing you a bone by letting you deduct meals anyway. So um, they actually changed that rule for 2021 and 2022. And they said, as long as you purchase a meal from a restaurant and it has a business purpose, then you can deduct 100% of it. And they used that law to stimulate the hospitality industry, to basically to encourage people to go have meals at restaurants, right? So congressional tax law changes, they can do things like that to try to stimulate certain industries. Um, also, every presidential administration wants to put their mark in the American tax code, and they have. So George W. Bush did a major tax law change um, the Trump administration did the TCGA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, that was huge. And, um, and, and I'm sorry, I skipped the Obama administration. The Obama administration 
they added the net investment income tax and the Medicare surcharge taxes. And I can actually walk my clients through a tax return, a, you know, their tax return. And I can point to different pieces on their tax return and say, this is the George W. Bush administration. This is the Obama administration. And this right here is the Trump administration. And Biden is trying to do the same thing. Um, he, you know, tried to pass the Build Back Better bill um, in December, January, and was not successful in getting Congress to pass that. He's trying to kind of peel off pieces and pass various pieces. Um, if you, if your parents started getting checks from the Internal Revenue Sur Service last July, every month, those were advanced payments on the child tax credit. And July through the December, every month, families who qualified got checks in the mail from the government or direct deposit from the government. And that was actually part of the Biden administration doing an advanced child tax credit. So it's kind of fun to see how, to see how uh, each administration puts their mark on the tax code. Case law matters, and I won't bore you here, but um, how the courts are interpreting these taxes really, really, really matters. The Internal Revenue Service will often take people to court over a tax position. So like this case right here, Costello versus commissioner. Commissioner, that's the Internal Revenue Code. That's the Internal Revenue Service commissioner. Um, and so every, single every time you see a, a court case with commissioner, it means it's the IRS against this person. Um, and of course, Supreme Court with South Dakota versus Wayfair. It's called the Wayfair decision. And this is Wayfair, the company who sells online like home decor. And uh, uh, they actually were taken to the Supreme Court by South Dakota. And, um, and basically it is, establishes a concept that I love is tax nexus. What jurisdiction are you taxed in? And the Wayfair decision means that states can actually tax a company for sales tax purposes. This was sales tax, not income taxes. Um, can actually tax for sales taxes um, even if the company is not physically present in their state. So that affects, you know, every single time you order from Amazon, we don't have sales tax here in Oregon, but you know, in, in, in Arizona, we did have sales tax. And if I ordered from Amazon, Amazon re was required to um, charge me sales tax for that. And that is because of the Wayfair decision. So all these things are things that I have to keep up on and I have to advise clients on. Uh, and then the other thing I do, so it's not just taxes, I do financial statements. And I won't, I won't go into too much detail, to detail here because I think we're running out of time, but there is a financial statement looks like, um, hold on, let me see if I can, hold on one second, I'm gonna stop this. Try to pull up another area of my screen. You know, I mentioned to you earlier that accounting is the, it's the language of business and it really is. Um, I saved this sample financial statement for you. I'll let me pull it up over here. And um, this is just, you know, a sample construction company that I made here. And um, if you go through here, there's a table of contents that tells you what financial statements there are. This is the independent accountants review report. This is what you, this, you have to be a CPA to issue this report to the public. You're offering assurance to the public that you've looked at these financial statements. And depending on what sort of financial statement you have, there's different sort of assurance that's provided. So this is basically what a company is paying for with a financial statement is this report right here. And so you can see right here, we talk about responsibilities. We talk about, you know, the company's responsibilities. We talk about the accountant's responsibilities. And then, I, and then you give your conclusion. And the conclusion here says, this is a reviewed financial statement. It says, based on our reviews, we are not aware of any material modifications that should be made to the company financial statements in order for them to be in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. And this is accounting principles generally accepted. It's actually, it's actually called generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, G-A-A-P. So if you ever see G-A-A-P, it means generally accepted accounting principles. And it is, we have a US GAAP uh, 
um, way of speaking. And so what is US GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles? This is what it is. And sorry, I have some comments in here from a friend and I who we were using them. You know, you, you have a balance sheet and certain assets have to be presented in a certain form and certain disclosures have to be made. Here's your liabilities and your equity. And again, certain rules governing this, even, even rules governing what sort of footer goes down here, even the names of these financial statements. You've got a statement of income and retained earnings. Again, a lot of rules about how this is presented and how it's conveyed. This is, this is a very important statement. This is your revenue minus all of your expenses. Brings you down to your net income. A cash flow statement shows you how did the company use their cash during the year? And there's a couple of ways of presenting this. And this is one of them. And then we get into the meat of a financial statement. Get into the footnotes, the notes to the financial statements. And this is where most of the information is contained. And I have very strict disclosures about what I disclose and what I put here and what I can say and what I, I mean, what I have to disclose. And so you can see like method, method of accounting for contracts. This is a large construction company. Remember I told you the timing of how they report income. I have to tell people how they do that. Percentage of completion right here. Contract receivables. And you go through and, you know, advertising, property and equipment, income taxes is a big note. Um, then we give some details. So you get a little more detail in the footnotes about what, what things were on those financial statements. Pro what sort of property and equipment does the company own? Um, lots of construction contract specific language here. Um, and a line of credit. The company has a line of credit with the bank. Most businesses do. What sort of debt does the company have? Uh, we have to disclose what debt they have. And then not only that, we have to tell the user of the financial statement, how much debt is the company gonna owe for the next five years? So you can see, okay, what are they in the hook for? And then operating leases, unions, um, retirement plans, any subsequent events. And then you get into any sort of supplemental, su supplementary information that's useful for the user of a financial statement. Um, and there's all sorts of different, um, if you're a construction comp co company, you include a schedule of jobs that you've completed during the year. And then you also, include a schedule of what's in process still under construction. So that is, uh, those are financial statements um, and there's three levels of service. And I believe this is my, yep, this is my last slide. There's three levels of service for those financial statements. The actual financial statement doesn't change, only that report on the front changes. Um, audited financial statements are the highest level of service. It's very expensive. Um, the, basically the report says that the financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects. And there is a lot of the auditors will go in and they'll test internal controls and they'll vouch things and they'll, they'll, they'll verify everything or a sample of, of stuff and then reviewed financial statements, which is what I prepare. I don't do audits. I only do reviews and compilations. Reviews is where you say you're not aware of any material modifications. That's what we were looking at. Um, it doesn't contemplate fraud or internal controls, and I don't do any testing. I mostly look at uh, ratios, and then I do a ton and ton, a ton of questions with management. And then compiled financial statements where there's absolutely no assurance, no assurance provided, and basically that the financial statements are just appropriate in form. So, I mean, a lot of new words, a lot of different things, two main branches of being a CPA, tax, and then assurance. I do a little of both. Um, a lot of CPAs uh, will only do one. They'll either do tax or they'll do financial statements and assurance. I can tell you right now, a lot of kids nowadays really like assurance. Um, it, it is fun. They like the financial statement side of it. Tax requires long hours for compressed periods of the time. So when you do taxes, you'll work really hard, you know, January through April 15th, and then your hours will come way down in the summertime, and then they might spike again at extension time. And a lot of a lot of um, a lot of kids nowadays don't really like 
the highs and lows of that. I don't mind it. I love it. I love having a summer that's free where I don't have to do a lot of work. I love that. And, um, and, uh, and I'm willing to work really hard, um, January through April to, to, in order to have nice, relaxing summers. So it's just, you know, really what your preference is. I, that's my presentation and I want to, it looks like we have a few more chats here and I just want to open it up to questions. Um, it looks like what are working conditions like? So um, working conditions are really good. Um, firms will provide um, a retirement plan. That, so they'll provide a 401k plan. Um, you usually will have a cubicle at the firm. Um, a lot of people work from home nowadays with COVID-19. It's, it's a job that's very easy to do from home. Um, if you like that, a lot of CPAs and a lot of the bosses now at the firms let uh, kids do kind of a hybrid. Like they can come into the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then they can work from home on Thursdays, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then during tax season, you work Saturdays you know, <laughs> and then um, for outlook for the career, um, I feel like it's going through a transition right now. I feel like public accounting is, it is such a valuable career. Um, job security is, it gets better and better every day. Every single time there's another tax law change, every single time there's another corporate scandal, this stuff just gets more and more important. And um, you know, the internal revenue code is so complex now that, you know, almost everybody really does need a CPA <laughs> in order to navigate it, unfortunately. And um, so there's a lot of job security. Um, the firm environment, though, I think, so here's my two cents on that. I think a lot of the CPA firms are owned by, um, they're owned by an older generation of, of Americans. Um, and there's a major shift going on in our entire economy right now with technology and with just the way we approach and we do business and what we expect of our employees and workers. And public accounting is right in the middle of that transition right now. And I have full faith that they're gonna come through it really well, but there is this transition that's happening. And what I really loved about uh, my, my previous firm, Jones and Roth, is, is that a lot of the shareholders, remember I said there were 13 shareholders, a lot of the shareholders are very young at that firm. And they're very forward thinking and they're very, um, they're very quick to embrace technology and they're very quick to embrace new ideas. And, um, and so I think the profession absolutely will come through it, but it's going through some growing pains right now. Um, I would encourage you, if you have any interest at all in, in knowing rules, kind of being like an attorney, knowing the rules, interpreting the rules, um, and then having a lot of client interaction. I, I go out um, and, you know, I joke that I'm a member of the family with every one of my clients because I feel like I'm a member of their family. I know them. Uh, I know the owners of the business. I know their employees. Um, I know the owners of the business, I know the, the owner's kids. And in fact, I do some of the taxes for the kids. And I, I you know I get holiday presents from them in the mail. And, um, and I know um, they always, there's a saying that's called the CPA is a, is a trusted advisor. And it really is true. We are, as a CPA, I am a trusted advisor for my clients. Whenever a big life event happens, I'm usually the first one to know. Um, I'm usually the first one to know when a new baby's coming. I'm usually the first one to know when a marriage is coming. I'm usually the first one, I mean, outside of family. <laughs> I'm usually the first one to know if there's a divorce that's coming. And um, I'm the first one to know what sort of new banking relationships are wanted. Um, you know, what sort of, you know, should I lease? Should I buy? Should I, should I sell this piece of land? Should I keep this piece of land? Should I open this new business? Can you help me? pick the business entity type. I, I love helping my clients and it's been a very rewarding career for me. And that's about it. Any other questions? You can put them in the chat box. I think that that is it. Thank you so much for um, giving us all this education and on um, becoming a CPA.